hello everybody welcome to this session uh, this live session on uh, on the teleconference system and also broadcasted live over social media uh, it's a great uh, honor and uh, really a, a fantastic uh, opportunity to have here today representatives of the aspen institute kiev and uh, a, an event uh, hosted by aspen institute romania of course, the topic which we are going to debate is um, Ukraine and uh, what, what and um, what the consequences for for leadership in such a difficult period would be. What would be uh, the measures and the outlook for uh, rebuilding and ensuring the resilience of Ukraine? And of course, we are going to focus on deep human values and what everybody of us can or should do in such difficult period. But at the end of the day, let's take the opportunity to salute the acting presidents of the two Aspen Institute. I would first ask Ms. Yulia Tichkivska to say hello to the audience, uh, maybe add two or three words because I reserved a spot for her at the end of our meeting. Uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to be here with all of you today online. Um, Aspen Romania is a big friend of Aspen Kiev and uh, for, for, for many years already and uh, I'm very delighted to be to, to receive the support and just uh, like uh, to develop the partnership we already developed for, for, for many years. What we in Ukraine uh, are experiencing now is the war of, the war of our independence. Of, it's the fight for our existence but also that's a fight for uh, Europe's peace and global freedom. It's a fight for values. And uh, many of those who had Aspen experience, they know that the biggest part of our mission as Aspen Institute is to promote value-based leadership. Leadership which is based on values. And at Aspen, we always understand values as not as some declarations, but we do believe that values are our actions. That the way how we act and which decisions we take. So I do believe that like February 24th was a big day for the whole world to go through the test of values and to really show uh, by actions which values we are fighting for, we believe for, and uh, uh, we live for. So um, today we organized this event having like three main goals uh, for this meeting. We do want to tell you our stories the story of each speaker we have today. We have two prominent Aspen alumni, prominent uh, uh, speakers who are with us uh, today. We want to listen to your questions and it's a very important part for us to open this like window, open our hands and we are very welcome you to ask uh, your questions, share ideas if you have some, share, share comments. And also we do hope that we will find new friends who will stand with Ukraine in this fight, will stand in different fronts. So um, we are always open for any uh, ideas and cooperations in the future. I'm once again, very grateful to our uh, dear friends, uh, Aspen Romania for hosting this event today and, uh, and passing the floor uh, probably to Sergio for his introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julia. Um, I uh, feel very, very humbled to be uh, to be with you today, uh, and um, I'm uh, not exaggerating. Uh, I feel humbled because uh, we are talking about uh, defending freedom, and we actually have our neighbors, our dear neighbors, now standing for freedom and standing for the future of Europe. Um, I feel very humbled uh, of your sufferance, of your pain, uh, which I can assure you, although it doesn't mean much, we feel it equally here. Because, um, you know, it's for the first time in, in tens of years when we are not talking only theoretically about the conflict. We feel it, we hear it. And uh, we, are, we, are, we are in the middle of multiple crises unveiling. And the worst of all, uh, the sufferings and the loss of lives. And this is something which 
uh, should actually bring back, as Julia said, what are we doing for now and what are we doing for the future? So things like this don't repeat again. We in Aspen stand for value-based leadership. But what is leadership today? Leadership today is caring and doing together. Standing together for our values, standing together for our ability to be human. This is what we are militating for. This is what we stand for together. And also very coherent and very consistent to Aspen mission. It is probably our painful duty these days to think about the day of tomorrow and think how we can actually build societies driven by values. How are we going to be able to influence a different way of being going forward? I am, as I said, humbled to be here. I'm humbled to be part of this amazing group. And I'm really humbled to know all of you, our brothers and sisters from Ukraine. Thank you. Sergio, thank you very much. Those were uh, very emotional words. Um, it's uh, words I can see all around Romania, all around the Aspen community. And for sure, uh, next to those words, there is always um, a sentiment of hope, a desire of going forward, and of course, the accountability to lead with values, as Julia said. Uh, speaking of that, we have uh, prominent speakers today uh, from the Aspen family and surrounding, which I'm very, very honored to introduce. Uh, I hope uh, I, can, I can make a, a relevant uh, a yet short introduction for all of the speakers. I will begin with Ms. Alona Shkrum. Uh, she's an MP of the Ukrainian Parliament, uh, a Cambridge University graduate, a Master in Law from University of Pantheon Sorbonne, Paris. And uh, of course, she works uh, in the Parliamentarian Committee on Taxation, Banking and Finance. Of course, uh, her focus is international relation, interparliamentary diplomacy, public administration reform, and support for local, small, and medium businesses. Also, Alona is the president of the Interparliament Friendship Group with France and the secretary of the same friendship group or a similar friendship group with Great Britain. Before being elected as MP, she worked as, uh, with IDP as an advocacy expert on implementing partner of UNHCR, this is the United Nations Human Rights Commission, I think, and as a lawyer in Ukraine, France, and uh, Great Britain. She was awarded top 30 under 30 by the Kyiv Post, and obviously we're speaking about one of the young leaders of Ukraine. I salute her, ask her to say a short hi to the audience, and then we'll pass on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, hello, hello. Uh, well, thank you for this introduction. Now, now I feel almost very nervous to, to talk about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, but thank you for organizing this and thank you for your, you know, strong words of support, very emotional ones. And believe me, we value right now every action, but also every word. Uh, I have just actually met a number of uh, Romanian members of European Parliament who helped us a lot in Brussels, who were one of the first people to visit Bucha and Borodyanka and came to Kiev specifically. And, you know, we guys, we, we feel uh, right now every friendship and every uh, action and every uh, bravery that you also do uh, helping us economically and coming to Kiev, coming to Bucha, coming to Brussels, helping us with the context, we feel it strongly as an ever. And I think that this discussion is, is another action like that. 
Well, thank you very much for joining. Uh, and uh, of course, we feel the, the strength and hope uh, in, your, in your tone. Now I'll move to uh, Natalie Yaresko. Uh, Natalie served as the Executive Director of the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico and uh, created under the Bipartisan Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act of the USA. Previously, she spent two decades working as a Horizon Capital co-founder and CEO. She began her career in the public service in the United States, but of course, um, then after, after a stint as an economic section chief of the US Embassy in Ukraine from 92 to 95, uh, also served as a finance minister in the Ukrainian government. Natalia is making significant efforts to shed light on the acute issues of Russian invasion in Ukraine for the international community. And as an expert, she pays special attention to the issues of isolation of the Russian economic utilizing economy, utilizing sanctions, trade, and business boycott tools, as well as the strategy of recovering and reconstruction of the country, which obviously is going to be a huge topic. Natalie, welcome to the panel. Uh, please say hello to the audience. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Yuna, uh, for having us, for your very kind words. Um, for giving us this opportunity to share with you our experiences. The most critical thing right now from my perspective is to continue uh, that support, to double up on that support at this very difficult time as the war takes a very ugly turn and to uh, move as quickly as possible uh, to an end and to Ukraine prevailing in this war, saving democracy, saving peace for Europe and showing the world that autocrats cannot step on their neighbors. Thank you, Natalie. Those are uh, uh, powerful words. And uh, of course, we, we do believe, and this is why we're here, we do believe that values will prevail and that uh, you will prevail. Uh, I'm moving to the uh, uh, Romanian speaker right now. Uh, Ana Kataudza is a Romanian politician. She already has 15 years of experience in political and institutional communication, but also public policy formulation and implementation. Uh, of course, she was she worked as a consultant, but uh, some of her stints are really impressive. She worked with uh, with the World Bank office in Romania and Hungary. She worked at the at the Romanian Financial Supervisory Authority, and as said previously, she was CEO of a consultancy here in Romania. But uh, I, since I know Anna for quite a while, I can also say that uh, she's been feeling. Um, positions of responsibility since a very, very young age. She was served as a chief of staff and policy unit coordinator for the president of the Romanian Senate, uh, worked for the presidential uh, campaign of uh, one of the most pr prominent politicians here in Romania. And I'm sure you know, I'm talking about Mircea Joana, who is uh, a deputy secretary general of NATO. And uh, not least, uh, Anna worked uh, in the Romanian Gateway team project. It, it was a project of the Romanian government, the World Bank and business community on identifying and unlocking Romania's economic potential. Of course, she's an Aspen Young Leaders Fellow. Hello, Anna. Thank you so much for your kind words, Ionuts. Uh, I'm very honored to be here today, both as an Aspen Fellow and as a member of the Romanian parliament. It, I think this conversation is extremely useful because we, Romania, are in a way the closest neighbor uh, for Ukraine. And I think it's very important also for, for the Romanian public to, to really understand what is, what is happening in Ukraine and to, to also discuss about the, the great things that the Romanian citizens have done so far that have, have made us very, very proud. So thank you so much for inviting me here. And I do hope that we'll have a very constructive conversation. All right. Um, uh, somebody who will uh, uh, join us later, a distinguished panelist, uh, uh, Mr. Sigrid Mureshan, will also um, um, be presented uh, when he joins his, uh, in, in a couple of, of uh, minutes with us. I will present him when he joins. Until then, uh, I would uh, take on Anna's uh, words and actually invite uh, um, Alona to tell us a bit 
what can we understand better about what happens now in, in Ukraine? Of course, we see the media, we hear the stories, we follow the social media. Maybe Alona, tell us uh, how the people feel and what the leaders do. Uh, I, I will try, it's not an easy question. Um, you know, I, I was told I have seven minutes, so it's not easy to, to say, uh, you know, how people feel and what is going on in seven minutes as a brief. Um, I think that after about a month of war, uh, we, uh, we, we started to get a little bit used to this horrible situation that there is a war going on in Europe, uh, that there are millions and millions of people displaced internally and refugees. And everybody is doing everything they can. You know, businesses try to stay open or to be reopened. People are coming back. Uh, some of them uh, uh, are relocating towards the center. But of course, it's a completely um, horrible situation that we are getting used to this war in Europe. And we are speaking about it so much more calmly. You know, um, it, it took me about 40 days of war to actually um use makeup and like and, and and bring me to some kind of state of a normal moon appearance and brush my hair and blow dry my hair because it felt that every minute something is happening and you couldn't allow yourself to do that but now i'm i'm quite happily you know brushing the hair and using the makeup and it's it's, it's a little bit painful to do that because a lot of people still in mariupol are taken hostages a lot of people in Kherson on the occupied territories are not allowed to be evacuated and, and leave uh, or are being given Russian passports in in exchange for food uh, and uh, are being forced to vote in some kind of fake referendum which is going to happen and obviously right now the country is divided on the areas that were um, occupied but are now liberated and living almost a normal life in terms of war or obviously with the curfew every night obviously with about 13 percent of territory of ukraine mined which needs to be demined uh, so you cannot go even to bucha for example you cannot really return to your houses as normal because some of the mines we find them in the fridges of the people in the microwaves uh in washing machines that were left there. And we have to demine literally every house and every apartment and to check it so that there are no horrible accidents and there unfortunately are. But this is a kind of a normal, let's call it war situation and normal living. Cafes, cafes are reopening in Kiev, restaurants that were working only to serve food for the army are right now trying to work more and giving a percentage of their profit uh, again to the army or to other volunteer organizations. But another part of Ukraine, is still occupied in the east. A lot of small cities, a lot of cities like Kherson. Uh, people, you know, um, have been asking me for for days to help them evacuate, and this is something that we cannot do. And we've tried every way to include any international organization, to include Red Cross, uh, to include UNHCR, and it's it seems impossible from those occupied cities and from the city of Mariupol. And of course, we are preparing for the 9th of May. Um, I am thinking of going to Odessa for the 9th of May because I think this is where this will be another front. Uh, Odessa is planning to be um, really in the middle of another, you know, war war operation by Putin. Um, as as will be the whole east and the whole south. The 9th of May is this date, which is very symbolic to Putin and to his empire. And so we are we are gathering all the forces to defend for this date. But other than they, that, you know, every time. I'm, I'm asked to describe how we feel. Um, I think that it's it's something very, very uh, paradoxal because it, it has been, you know, the, um, the, the worst of times and the most tragic of times, but it's also have been one of the most wonderful of times because we've seen so much bravery and so much support and so much unity from European Union, from countries all over the world, from Ukrainians everywhere, from our friends. We have seen so much good together with the bad stuff that you know it it makes uh, it it makes this literally the time of a new era not just for ukraine but i think for the world in general uh, we have a lot of things still to do to make sure this never happens again and believe me that ukrainians desperately want to end this war we know that we will win this war um, but we desperately want it to end as fast as possible and to finish it in our territory. Because I've been right now on the visit to Brussels to talk with the 
European commissioners, to talk with members of parliament, of um, European parliament, to talk about the recovery plan, which is called the Marshall Plan in the US, the Brussels Plan in Brussels, um, to talk about what we need to do to, to make the sanctions more um, inclusive and more painful for, for Putin. Um, and uh, believe me, Ukraine is the one that really wants this war to end. Uh, and we do not want it to spread further to other territories because right now we are suffering uh, something that the world haven't seen since the Second World War. And we don't want anybody to feel this war in their territory, to feel this war in their homes, to see the curfew and the sirens every night. Uh, and we really feel that we need to stop it on Ukrainian territory right now with your help. If we are not successful, and I'm sure that we will be, um, but if we are not at some point successful, that I'm afraid that countries like Romania, Poland, uh, Slovakia, Balkan countries, Finland and Sweden, which have been threatened by Putin a number, number of times, might also feel what we are feeling. And I think that this is uh, even impossible to imagine right now. And we cannot allow all of us together for this to happen. So there is a strong feel of uh, bravery. There is a strong feel that Ukrainians are fighting for um, something much bigger than just the territory of our country, our own lives or our own kids and women and kindergartens. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that with every day we get stronger with your help, with the help of US, with the help of European Union, with the help of other institutions which were very reluctant to work before but are working now. And there is a strong sense of, uh, of course, fear, but more optimism and more, um, you know, hope. This sense of hope is everywhere in Ukraine, in Kiev now, even in Odessa. And I think this is pretty, you know, amazing time to be alive. I'm, I'm very, very honored to be a Ukrainian right now in this moment and to be with my people in this moment, uh, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a, a lot of sense to speak about seeking normality. It makes a lot of sense to speak about bravery and it makes a lot of sense to speak about Europe and the entire world. And the fact that this is not only a war which regards Ukraine. And I can assure you that none of us, none of us believe this is a Russia-Ukraine issue. This is something which we all feel regards the world. Speaking about the, the, the world, uh, Natalie, um, has a has a view maybe maybe from from the both sides of of, of this world we 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 tend to think that uh, uh, the U.S. is far away. She has been there in in 2014, and maybe this seems like another another very dif difficult period when when complex issues need to be administered. So, what is different this time, or how do you view it? So thank you very much. The financial situation is much different because it's much, much deeper <clears throat> in terms of the dysfunctionality. So if in 2014, it was a shock and a surprise to be invaded and to have 7% of the territory, 20% of the GDP destroyed. Um, and we were in a weakened position post-revolution back in 2014. So our banking system had not yet been cleaned up. We had new governments, new elections in every single level of, of government. <clears throat> now we have luckily built national bank reserves, which serve as a cushion. We have a stronger banking system, but so much more of the economy has been destroyed and or is incapable of functioning that the, econ the economic decline is viewed to be anywhere this year between 30 and 50% of GDP. With a decline in GDP like that, you can imagine that the budget situation for the government is dire. The budget is, is lacking in approximately $5 billion per month, a deficit of about $5 billion per month minimum. And that's just in keeping with a wartime uh, budget. What I mean by that is that bare minimum expenditures are being made, one, to pay the military their salaries, two, to pay the families of the deceased military, three, pensions, four, our medical care, our nurses, our doctors have to have their salaries. And then there is a payment for the internally displaced people so that they can make uh, their lives in a new part of the country. And this $5 billion per month is something I think the international community has not yet gotten their hands around. The IMF spoke about it last, last week during the annual meetings. 
But if you look at the amount of money that's been committed for macro support since the war started, about $11 billion, of which important to note only 1.4 is grants. Much of it is in concessional loans. And I can tell you right now that those loans are going to be very hard to repay. It means that the international community has to come together with a much greater financial support package. We've all been very focused on the military support package and that is absolutely critical, but equally important is keeping the central services for the 40 million people who remain in Ukraine and enabling them to continue life. So I, I, I think that there is going to be, I, I know the United States has announced yesterday that they're gonna seek legislation for incremental financial support in the amount of one to $2 billion per month the EU is going to be, have to come up with incremental monies as well as the, inter, the rest of the international community, the internet, the IMF, the World Bank. Closing that budget gap is really critical. From the other perspective, Ukrainian businesses are doing everything they can to restart. Alona mentioned this already. Where they can, they are restarting. Low cost subsidized loans are available for agriculture to farm, for SME, small and medium sized business to get operating again. And there is even a loan facility for businesses to move their, their manufacturing from the hard hit east and south into the central and western part of the country, if at all possible. So the Ukrainian economy is trying to be responsible. Mm -hmm. Business people are doing what they can to uh, continue working. And in that respect, the announcement that I think came yesterday that the European Union was going to seek to reduce all tariffs, eliminate all quotas, and eliminate all anti-dumping uh, anti uh, rules that are in place right now against Ukrainian exports is critically important. The UK is doing that, the EU is doing that. That will free up in particular for agricultural goods, the ability to export what we can, um, which also helps the world. Because as you know, our inability to export because of the suffocation of our ports and the strangulation of the economy is going to cause a whole nother economic crisis. I talked to you first about Ukraine, but there's going to be global hunger issues. Ukraine feeds 400 million people in the world. And if you've heard from the World Food Program director, they say they are taking food from the hungry and giving it to the starving in order to make ends meet. So, the Northern African, Middle Eastern countries that are typical buyers of Ukrainian grains are going to be facing food shortages, which will only then affect the European economy even more. And you'll see a whole new wave of migrants, hungry migrants coming from that part of the continent to Europe. I think it's important to note that when we focus, this is just the current situation. The last thing I'll say is we also need to start thinking and planning rebuilding. Rebuilding Ukraine is going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars, if not close to a trillion in my estimate. And I think that when we look at the Marshall Plan, it is a plan that was really only in today's dollars, $115 billion. And the Marshall Plan really was not about rebuilding. It was really about re-energizing and, and, and providing dollars into the European economies and getting Europe to trade and to be a, a, a more cohesive economy. This is going to be the largest rebuilding that the world has ever seen to date. This is gonna be larger than Kuwait after the Iraqi war or Afghanistan, larger than what I've lived through here in Puerto Rico after a hurricane, Hurricane Maria in 2017, we had $100 billion in damage. And Puerto Rico is 166 the size of Ukraine. So we are literally talking about hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. The one thing that we can do right now is legislate to take the frozen assets of the Central Bank of Russia and any other sanctioned entities and set them aside as the core, as the very base of that rebuilding campaign. We've frozen approximately 300 billion in central bank reserves and another 100 billion globally in other oligarch and sanctioned entities. That money should serve at the core and then bilateral, multilateral, and very importantly, private sector money has to come in in an organized coordinated fashion to rebuild Ukraine once we prevail in the war. So I wanted to just walk you through 
the Ukrainian financial crisis, what I think is the growing global financial crisis, and then the future of rebuilding. Natalie, thank you very much. I think that's a very comprehensive view. Um, it, it fits with uh, many papers which I which I just reviewed in in the wake of this uh, panel debate. It is nevertheless the first time that I hear the the figure of one trillion, and 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 I think uh, we should not underestimate that. And of course, I, uh, the the most uh, some of the most valuable insights which you provided on the global consequences and the second round and the third round consequences are again something which should not be underestimated. Um, from, from that point of view, uh, I would switch now to Anna and, and ask her, as an MP, as a young MP uh, uh, in, in Romania, how much the policy uh, consequences of what happens in Ukraine on the humanitarian side and on the economic side are being um, are, be, are being made aware to the to the legislators of of uh, European countries parliaments and uh, and what is the debate focusing on right now if I may ask or of course if there's another another angle which I might have missed please free, feel free to add uh, thank you so much, Janusz. Thank you, Alona. Thank you, Natalie. It, it was a very interesting description, both from uh, a more personal, let's say, point of view and uh, a very, a very interesting uh, description of what is going on with the Ukrainian economy and in its impact on, on the world stage. You know, we, the Romanian parliament, and I think that when I, I can say this in, in the name of all my colleagues. We do understand that the war in, in Ukraine and the illegal invasion of, of Ukraine by the Russian Federation has changed everything. The world as we knew it before February 24 does no longer exist. Uh, it has changed us in terms of how we interact with each other. It has changed in the way we understand the uh, strategic autonomy on, on different economic levels that the European Union and the European countries should have. And it has, it has also brought into the conversation uh, a discussion, a broader discussion about, about different leadership models. Uh, if we all should admit before before February 24th, even in Romania, there were some that said that the uh, autocratic model of leadership uh, had its appealing and its um, strong points, let's say it. Now it is very clear for everybody. Uh, and unfortunately, it, we, we, and especially you, had to pay such a huge cost for us all to understand that democracy with all its flaws is, as Churchill said, the best form of, of, of uh, government and of leadership. To be very honest, I was very surprised how well the Romanian citizens reacted to this. Um, I was a bit afraid that after this pandemic and with the economic crisis coming and with the energy prices increasing, I was a bit afraid that the Romanian population would be more selfish. Uh, but I was impressed, I was really impressed to see how they open their arms and their homes and, and uh, received their fellows from, from Ukraine. And, and it was um, in, the first, in the first weeks, I received calls from almost all my friends and acquaintances asking me, Anna, how can we help? Uh, and this happened before the Romanian authorities uh, managed to create a system. This happened before the NGOs intervened. This happened before the, the business environment intervened. Now we have, we have the humanitarian hubs, uh, the one in Suchava that has an European dimension, the one in Tulcha that has an international dimension. It is uh, jointly operated by the County Council and Israel and, and uh, American NGOs. 
uh, and and now things are a little bit more organized and we do now we are able now to have an institutional response but in the first few days it was about romanian citizens welcoming their neighbors into their homes and i think that is is very important and talking about values and talking about uh good, good governance and leadership i think we all should learn from from the way romanians reacted in in the first in the first days and, and the way they are reacting now because uh i I was I was in uh, in Tulcea, and I was very I was very proud to see how people are staying there 24 hours, seven days a week, and helping their their fellows from from Ukraine. Um, I was also in Ismail. I uh, this is the first time I'm making this public. Uh, I wanted to be able to. Um, not only talk about what is going on in Ukraine, but also to see what is going on in Ukraine. Fortunately, Ismail so far has not been has not been attacked, has not been bombed. But I I was there and visited a, a center of refugees, and I remember asking a lady where she was from. She had three children, and she said Mariupol, and then her her. Uh, look became so so sad um, that I I just could not <laughs> could not say anything and and that that look stays with me and and whenever I talk to my colleagues whenever I I am in uh, in public debates I remember that look and I I I I'm, I can only imagine what horrors uh, that lady from Mariupol has seen in, in 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 the last in the last few weeks as as um as uh, the country that has the largest border with ukraine uh we have also tried to help this reconstruction process but also to help the business environment in ukraine function during these days uh, we have invested more in the ports of Constanza, and yesterday there was an announcement that we are going to invest even more in the port of Galati, so that uh, merchandise that comes from Ukraine can be transported and can be uh, taken to different to different countries, so that the, the commerce can continue. Also, uh, we are investing in uh, railways because. Uh, there is a need to to uh, help on, not only with the transportation on on by sea but also with the transportation on the ground through the railways also we have we have been very clear and i want to be very clear today that romania supports ukraine's accession to the european union together with the republic of moldova and georgia because talking about the Republic of Moldova, we are also extremely, extremely concerned about what is going on these days in, uh, in Tiraspol and in Transnistria. We are very cautious about the, the, how the events develop there. And we are also very concerned about the date of, of May 9th, uh, when, when in, uh, in addition to Putin most likely announcing a so-called imaginary victory, we are extremely afraid not for this conflict not to uh, also also go to Transnistria, where we do know that there is a pro-Russian population uh, and also uh, the presence of military, active military uh, presence of the, of the Russian Federation. So we are extremely concerned, but we are very, very determined in, in standing with Ukraine, in supporting its European path, because in this is in this 15 years since we've joined the EU, um, even though things are not as we have hoped before, uh, it is obvious that being part of the larger European family, it has helped the Romanian economy, has helped Romania to develop, and we do want this also for for our Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian neighbors. Um, I do have some other notes, but I, I don't want to take the time uh, too much because I'm very sure that those who, who listen to this conversation are 
even more interested in what our Ukrainian friends have to say. But if there are any questions, I am uh, I am here to answer. Thank you very much, Anna. I actually will take the opportunity uh, to present uh, Mr. Siegfried Mureshan. He gracefully joined us and uh, uh, thank you again uh, for, for joining us. I think he, he brings a really a valuable experience, uh, not only as a European Parliament uh, MP, but also as, uh, as an EU official, which has had an extensive look and experience also on what happens on the Eastern border and as what regards the programs defining the economic and resilience programs, which would define the, the future of Europe. Now, apparently the situation uh, got another complexity. And of course, this is an understatement to, to reflect the, unfortunately, the, 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 the tragic situation in Ukraine, both on the humanitarian side and uh, on the economic side, might might be also possible on the institutional side, but I would take the opportunity to invite Mr. Uh, Siegfried Mureshan to tell us what is the view in Brussels and uh, possibly uh, how, maybe, maybe tell us about the, the commitment and the directions of commitment of EU towards Ukraine today as, as they are uh, visible today. And then we will get a bit into the into a couple of questions regarding uh, the human side, the business side, the institutional side with all of the panels. So welcome, Mr. Muneshan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Lutz. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really delighted to be with you. Apologies for the fact that I joined late and that I will have to leave early, but we are here at a meeting of the European People's Party in Prague discussing exactly the situation in Ukraine and the security situation in Central Eastern Europe. We had the intervention by the Romanian Prime Minister that I was involved and we will have the Moldovan Prime President Maya Sandu in half an hour uh, talking to us uh, online here at the meeting in, in Prague. So that's why I will have to leave a bit earlier. So the truth is that um, the um, Invasion of the Russian armed forces into Ukraine has changed the perspective on many things at the European level. Two months ago, I still had colleagues in the European Parliament who were sure that the, um, that, uh, the Russian armed forces would never invade Ukraine. Uh, they simply did not see, did not understand, did not read correctly the warnings that we had received from the Russian Federation in the last years. The uh, annexation of Crimea the invasion into Donetsk and Lugansk 2014-15, uh, um, Georgia 2008, Chechnya 1999. So the signs were all there, but the European public opinion simply did not understand them properly. Now, everyone in Europe understands that we can only live in safety and security within the borders of NATO and within the borders of the 27 member states of the European Union if we are surrounded by countries which are safe and stable Everyone understands that uh, defending Ukraine means defending ourselves. This is why the readiness to help at the level of the European Union is very big. And also people understand that the Republic of Moldova is important. The Republic of Moldova is for the safety of the European Union of no less importance than Ukraine is. This is why ourselves as Romanians, as poor Europeans in Central Eastern Europe, we need to be clear in our messages in Brussels the European Union has to offer to the Republic of Moldova exactly what it offers to Ukraine. And Moldova deserves this because people have spoken in the last parliamentary and the last presidential elections uh, very clearly for the pro-European forces electing a pro-European president and giving a large majority to the pro-European party in the Moldovan parliament. So um, the EU accession um, letter uh, handed in by Moldovan authorities really reflects the will of the people in the Republic of, uh, in the Republic of Moldova. So we have to support the pro-European path. Um, and the European Parliament has already given that European perspective to Ukraine. And I hope we will be able to adopt a similar resolution to give it also to Moldova soon. Because if Ukraine says, they want to join the European Union when we're seeing how they are defending, in fact, European values. Our answer can only be one. Yes, you are welcome to join. We have to be honest and transparent to them. The path to fulfilling the EU membership will be long. And uh, 
uh, there are many difficulties to overcome in Ukraine, but also on the European side. This will take years. But what we have to say is that the perspective is there. We know there's many things to be done to uh, be overcome, but uh, we are ready to start work and we are starting it now. And in fact, the EU institutions are already working on that. The questionnaires were sent to the Moldovan and Ukrainian authorities. They were answered already um, partly. So the commitment is there. Um, uh, then, of course, um, in addition to the perspective, there is the support which is needed. When it comes to humanitarian aid, the EU member states bilaterally, the European Union have already done a lot. The Republic of Moldova is the European country which received per capita more Ukrainian refugees than any EU member state. So in relation to its population, they received more refugees than any member state. And this pro-European spirit in Moldova, um, confirmed by the elections, confirmed by how the Ukrainian refugees were welcomed now in Moldova, increased a lot the credibility of the Republic of Moldova at European, uh, at European level. So there is humanitarian support for Ukraine, for Moldova coming from the EU side. Romania plays an essential role through the European hub created in Suchava with EU support and with the big involvement of Romanian of, um, of Romanian um, of Romanian authorities. Um, then, of course, um, there will be the question of rebuilding Ukraine. The cost of the military invasion so far is at about 1,000 billion euros. Uh, this is the level of destruction. Uh, nobody alone will be able to put that, uh, pull that amount of money together. So we will need an effort where everyone contributes. The international community, international financial institutions, our American partners, the European Union from EU level, but also bilaterally from the member states. And we should also find a way in which uh, after the war, Ukraine can develop as much as possible uh, by itself. And for this, I have a concrete proposal. Um, I say that Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova should be admitted into the European single market. Long before we will be able to accept them institutionally and politically into the European Union, we can do one thing, integrate them into the single market. That means that they can export without any barriers, without any limitations, without any tar tariffs to the EU market. Mm, there will be more European investments into Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova, more jobs, uh, higher paid, uh, higher salaries. They will enjoy the four freedoms, the freedom of movement of people, of goods, of capital, of services, and um, they will implement a big part of the European acquis, the European legislation, which means environment standards, consumer protection standards, in simple words, a higher standard of living for the Moldovan and Ukrainian uh, citizens in their countries, even before uh, they are able to, uh, to join. To conclude, um, the invasion changed everything. People in Europe now understand. We need to make sure that this common assessment um, is kept. We need to make sure that the unity uh, of the EU prevails. And people should understand that for as long as there will be an autocratic regime in Russia, Russia will be a threat for the security of Europe, of each of our countries. Um, because autocratic regimes in Russia need enemies. They need wars to justify their existence. So they will be imperialistic, they will be, they will be aggressive. So we need to stay united. And in order for people to, um, in order to keep this unity, we have to make sure that people are properly informed about the dangers, the threats coming from Russia, tackling fake news, disinformation, propaganda, is one important task. And this is why also our discussion, our debate today is, is so important. Once again, thank you very much for the invitation. It was my pleasure. I will unfortunately have to leave shortly for the discussion with President Sandu, but it's really a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, those were very clear, outspoken, and um, I think words charting possible solutions which uh, many politicians nowadays seems, seem to rather formulate in more general terms. Uh, Mr. Mureshan, if you would uh, still be with us uh, two minutes, 
there was a question in in uh, in my mind which I wanted to 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 do around and um, please um, uh, just uh, just try to to use as little time as is available to you to sort of open open the debate here and the question is. Is EU prepared for acting as a as a coordinator of this massive, massive reconstruction plan, which obviously everybody seems to identify uh, regarding uh, Ukraine? And of course, there are a, a, a bit of other nuances which I would like uh, afterwards the other the other speakers to to touch upon. But please um, um, help us with your view, and and then uh, we understand that you have to fill the other obligations which you informed us, of course. Thank you. Ukraine needs a Marshall-like plan. Um, we shall do it. Uh, doing it does not only mean that we help Ukraine, but it means that we help ourselves, because if Ukraine is stable, if we create a perspective of prosperity there, it means that there will also be stability in Romania and other member states of the European Union. So yes, we should do it. Yes, the institutions of the European Union are already thinking of it. They are ready to, um, to take the leading role, but we have to be honest and transparent. The European Union alone will not be able to fund this. The European Union um, can use its expertise, its tools, its mechanisms um, to create the framework. It will provide part of the funding as well, but it will have to be everyone around. Uh, public money, but we should also try to trigger as much private investment as possible. And in order for private investment to find Ukraine attractive, um, letting Ukraine join the single market is one thing which would be very, very useful. Secondly, of course, it will be reforming Ukraine, reducing cutting, uh, cutting red tape, reducing bureaucracy, all of those measures. Um, strengthening the rule of law, um, improving the competitiveness of the economy. Um, so all of these reforms, once the war is over, we have to help Ukraine do so that they become attractive for, uh, for investments. Um, we have done, at the level of the European Union, the biggest package of economic support ever after the beginning of the COVID pandemic, 750 billion euros. Um, the biggest package of economic support ever launched at European level, Romania alone for its recovery plan receives about 30 billion euros. Half of it in grants, money that we will not have to pay back, half of it in loans. But whenever there is money paid, someone needs to pay it back. And from this recovery and resilience facility, half of it is loans that go to member states and they will pay them back in the very long period of ter uh, time. The loans are under very good conditions, small interest rates. But for the grants component, someone will have to pay it back and the member states will not pay it back because it's grants. So either we introduce uh, some so-called own resources at European level uh, so that the EU has own sources of revenue so that the money from the recovery and resilience facility can be paid back or um, um, the member states paid back, but this will not happen, or otherwise we risk reductions to the EU budget in the future, which is something that we absolutely want to avoid, of course, especially ourselves, Romania, because the EU funds are so important for us. What I want to say is, um, what I want to say is um, the European Union will contribute but before we talk concrete figures, we need to make sure that the sources of funding are clear and the efforts of the EU are already relatively stretched because we created this big, uh, this big uh, COVID uh, package. So as soon as we identify how we could pay such an instrument back, we are ready to also um, put concrete figures on the table from the EU side. But work on the design of it has already started and it's clear that EU member states will bilaterally also have to chip in to, uh, to uh, contribute. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm passing on uh, to Ms. Natalia Aresco. Um, you have been involved in the, in the past with, with similar issues, uh, restructuring the economy, negotiating the debt, uh, the debt reduction. And it seems that we, we rather talk of a, of a sort of tectonic shift in, in approaching the transformation of a country. Now the country is also at war, the, the need for support is, is massive. So the question is, uh, do you trust this can be achieved? 
and um, uh, following up on uh, on uh, uh, Mr. Moreshan's uh, uh, words, should EU take care of that? Should US take care of that, or should Ukraine have a, a, a sort of agency of sorts to, to to manage that? What is your your view? You obviously have been an insider of uh, to this kind of topics, and uh, maybe you can guide us a, a bit on into the options. Thank you very much. So on, on the rebuilding of Ukraine, separate from the current financial crisis, um, there is no single party that can be responsible for the rebuilding. It's too large, as I said earlier. And uh, I believe that we need to really expand uh, the parties that are a part of that rebuilding effort from the, fo from the focus of sourcing the amount of money that's necessary. So the EU should be an enormous part of it, but so should the United States, Canada, Japan. And I think we need to move beyond the G7 to the G20, frankly, um, as well as what, what the alphabet soup that we always look towards, the IMF, the World Bank, the EBRD, the EIB, and others. I think that there will have to be a single point of coordination on the donor side. And I use the word donor because I really believe this needs to be almost entirely grant-oriented to the maximum extent possible. Again, I think that the core of it needs to be Russian frozen assets. So the core of, the, of, of any rebuilding fund needs to come from Russian assets. I believe there should also be an ongoing Russian reparation, whether it's a tax on oil and gas sales in the future or some other constant um, source of, of, of revenue for this fund. But yes, Ukraine has to have its own coordination uh, agency on the other side. I think the critical issue from, from the donor side is going to be having confidence in the plan of rebuilding, one. And so that is on the Ukrainian side, for sure. They need to provide a plan. You're not going to rebuild everything that was destroyed. You're going to rebuild better. You're going to rebuild not the energy inefficient Soviet housing that was destroyed, but energy efficient modern housing. You're not going to rebuild an industry, Soviet period industry, but instead you're going to meet your COP26 targets now with green steel. So part of this is how do you build better for the future? Part of this is how do you recognize on the Ukrainian side the demographic changes that will occur? People will not all move back to the same towns and villages from where, where they came. So do you build schools there or do you build, build bigger schools elsewhere, for example? All of that planning needs to be done at the Ukrainian level, and the donors are going to want to have confidence in that plan. So that's one element. I think the second element that the donors are going to want confidence in is that the monies are going to be used appropriately as they are intended. And I think that is based on procurement. And I think that we need to have a single procurement uh, system that is transparent, that is repeatedly and constantly audited and reviewed and that the donors can have confidence in it, and yet it does not slow down what should be uh, a very urgent rebuilding process. I look often at the relationship between FEMA in the United States, which is an agency called the Federal Emergency Management Agency that responds to hurricanes and how it has a very, very specific procurement process and funding process for the communities that have been hit, whether it's Florida, New Orleans, or whether it's Puerto Rico. And to me, that, that makes the greatest amount of sense so that you're, dis, you're, you're distributing funds uh, on the basis of a plan that has confidence and a system of procurement that builds confidence and one that is consistently reviewed and audited to contain and to continue that confidence. But I think it is a, it is a massive coordination on the donor side that's required. Remember the Marshall Plan was one donor. <laughs> this is very different. We should have more than a dozen donors, 20 donors, 25 donors. Um, and then there needs to be a very uh, good coordination, planning, and confidence building procurement system um, on the Ukrainian side. And then the last thing that I'll mention is um, because the private sector has to play an important and, and, and greater role, there will have to be unique and, and creative mechanisms developed by the bilateral and multilateral partners to encourage business. There's gonna to have to be much greater focus on political risk insurance right now. 
there's going to have to be much greater um, focus on how to uh, give businesses confidence that the court system in Ukraine will be functional and uh, fair. And so there are ideas such as those of Anders Aslan, a Swedish economist, to create for foreign investors a uh, court that operates on Ukrainian law, but with foreign judges such that for the interim to accelerate this confidence building moment, um, there is a clear uh, judicial um, fairness and judicial uh, confidence. Again, confidence building is going to be the biggest issue I, I, I fear we need to focus on. So those are the pieces I think that that need to be worked on. And I think it's going to require coordination like we've never seen before. So coordination like we've never seen before uh, also, also um, triggers the question of um, whether the local uh, political and institutional establishment is ready to commit to that in a, in a, in a consistent, in a, a prolonged uh, manner and also the public. So I would return now to Alona Shkrum. Um, is the Ukraine establishment ready to go through a lengthy process of actually proving and committing uh, to, the, um, to all the, the standards, the requirements, the institutional changes? And is the public uh, expected to, to, to buy into that vision? Uh, because I, I want to be honest here, this is not something which would be achieved um, over the weekend or over a week or over a month. It's going to take years. So can you tell us about the, the, the commitment and, and, um, and the desire to go into that direction? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, well, first, uh, let, me, let me tell you a number of, uh, of facts that some of them have been told already, but they're important to understand the whole picture. Uh, so yes, as Natalia Yeraisko has said, we have lost almost half of our economy right now. And those are, of course, are the bad news because the war is still going. Um, I have all the figures of how, how many people, how many companies start stopped working and what is going on, but the, the overall picture is that it's looking very bad. It's the devastating war, and obviously it is still going, it will be worse. As I said, 13% of the territory are mined, 40% uh, of companies, approximately 39, 41% have stopped working and we are trying right now to recover them. Uh, we have done a big plan to actually move the companies to um, the west of Ukraine and to other countries. We are hoping that Romania will also step up. I know Polish, Polish colleagues have already stepped up a little bit and started to relocate those companies. We have had exactly 860 um, de demands like electronic demands uh, registered by companies who want to relocate and we are relocating them for free by the Ukrainian railway, by the Ukrainian postal service, etc, etc. But of course this is not enough. Uh, so we have had damages, on it, we estimate more than one trillion some estimate over two trillion right now, and they are still ongoing. So this is something that which no Marshall Plan, no Brussels, Brussels Plan will ever be able to get in terms of numbers. Obviously, we want investments. Obviously, we need you know partnerships. Um, more than twelve million people relocated. Um, um, five million relocated abroad. Ninety percent of them are women and children. You probably know that Romania has taken a big chunk of more than. 700,000 people on your territory. Uh, Poland has taken the biggest chunk of uh, 2.8 million. Uh, Moldova has taken 100,000, and I think we'll, we'll have more. Uh, Hungary, 470,000 people, and Slovakia, about 340,000. So obviously, you know, the, the closest neighbors are doing a big part of work, and we are super grateful for that because you've all, uh, almost all of the European countries given them a right to work, given them a right to stay for at least 90 days and given them this temporary protection directly from the European uh, side. Um, obviously, we would need to go uh, on a larger detail on how any of the Marshall Plan or any of the Brussels Plan, because in Brussels, we specifically talked about the European uh, part of this plan, how this would actually uh, work for what industries, for what territories, for what short time period investment and long short, long period investment. Uh, I think that you have seen already that Ukrainians are a very stubborn nation, um, a very proud one. We for sure do not want to be beggars. We want to be partners. We want to 
present good investment possibilities. We want you know, to, to, to work for the longer period of time, not just for rebuilding Ukraine, but actually for integrating us completely into the European market. It's not just about the single market because we did receive the good news today that the European Commission already have agreed and, and pushed for um, lowering all the uh, quotas and uh, to, well, uh, lowering all the taxes and import duties to zero, uh, stopping the anti-dumping investigation, stopping the anti-dumping the duties and safeguarding duties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is all brilliant because this is something that allows us actually to export to European Union with no other tariffs and no uh, import duties for for one year. Um, but we would we would need much more. And here uh, we have talked uh, in a quite detailed way with a lot of European commissioners in Brussels, with a lot of um, different embassies on what industries would be, we, would be of interest to European countries, to America, uh, on where we are the strongest, where we can uh, provide a big chunk of what was lost. We are not just talking about agriculture, also agriculture is super crucial, as Natalia has said, for the rest of the world, for the African countries. And I will not cite the numbers, but you know that if we do not find, together with you, the logistics to get our grain and to get our agricultural products, either through the ports, which are blocked right now, or through Romania, Poland, and other, uh, you know, other countries, to Africa, then we will have a much bigger problem of uh, hunger in, in in the world and in Africa, and not just in Africa. I, I am super, you know, surprised to see in France that the in certain shops, especially on the south of France, um, certain shops raised the price of their croissants twice, and they are saying that this is because of Ukrainian uh, war and Ukrainian you know, grain, grain um, export losses. I was actually talking to some of the shop owners because I do not believe that so fast the France could have suffered it, but this is, you know, this is what they get with, with, uh, with their, this information. So first, uh, we do need a single market and we are working for it. Second, I believe, and this is something maybe not very popular for me to say, but I will, I believe that we should have the, uh, their accession to you first and the complete integration to you second. Uh, I do understand that, you know, that there are other countries who've been waiting for it. I do understand that Georgia has been waiting for it. I do understand Moldova. But right now, we cannot be looked on one track. So obviously, my, Moldova deserves to be there and has to be there. And, you know, the security of Moldova is as important as the security of us. We do understand that completely. And believe me, we talk about that with you and with Moldova every day. And we actually are very much afraid that from Transnistria, 5,000 Russian soldiers will attack us from, from the Transnistria side. And this is really the case for the 9th of May as well. Uh, but we cannot be joined together on one track because we have done very different work and very different passes that lead us to that. We have different numbers of completion of our EU association agreements, and we have different priorities on our industry streets and our expert needs. So how do we secure that this goes forward? Well, first of all, uh, I don't think that we have any other choice. We were told on the first three days of war that we will have a government in exile uh, by the end of the first week, that we will have a parliament ex in exile. And a number of ambassadors from all over the world called me and told me that they have an apartment for me in Warsaw or in Krakow, whatever I want, because there would be a parliament in Warsaw or Krakow or Rzeszow at the, at the, at the latest. Um, this did not happen. And this did not happen because we did not subject ourselves to fear, but we moved, you know, one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. We protected Bucha first, then Gostomel, then Kiev. Kiev was under attack for at least three weeks, and there was a big possibility that Kiev would be a smaller twice the size that it is right now, and it always was. We could have lost a number of times the left bank of Kiev, I can tell you that honestly now. And we would be left with just the right bank on the river Dnipro. This did not happen because we moved one step by step by step. So I'm sure that in this situation, we also need to move one step by step because the picture is so big and the amount of money we need is so huge. As Yaresko has said, we, we need actually about four to five billion uh, dollars for each month to cover our 
pensions, social employment, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and the good news are that this morning we also received that there is a willingness to pay for at least a number of months from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, it's not been settled, and let's hope that it goes forward. But yeah, there is this understanding from the from the world countries. So we take the first step. The first step is a single market to the EU and export of our companies and relocating our companies. We have started to do that. The second step would be candidacy, and I hope we will receive it in one month. We are talking uh, you know, to a lot of countries and we need the consensus for that, which is not easy. And here your support is you know, undescribably big and huge. The third step would be to produce this kind of Brussels plan and Marshall plan together and integrate them with specific details for specific industries, for specific companies, for specific cooperation agreements. So this has to be detailed, in my opinion, and we've started to do that, but it is a big chunk of work and obviously we need every expertise possible for that. I know that there is um, a council on the president of Ukraine has created and there is a specific working group that works just for that, for this detailed plan and guarantees and investments and, you know, specific areas of expertise. Third, we will work on their uh, acceptance of our membership to the European Union. It will take a year, probably more. I am very optimistic. I think it could be a year. And then we work at the needed reforms that we are able to work after the war is over, or at least not as aggressive as it is right now from the Russian Federation. And of course, we are talking about a huge reform of the public administration. This is something which I have been working on. And I actually think that this is a great opportunity for Ukraine. It sounds weird, but a lot of our civil servants are not existent anymore. They left Ukraine. A lot of them were uh, women. A lot of them were from the um, you know, all this generation and they have all left and we ask them to leave and they cannot return because it's not still safe. They had to work online. They had to learn how to work online. The COVID didn't learn them, learn them to do that, but the war did. And we have lost a lot of people. So we will need, you know, to, to start at the beginning and for the civil service reform, for the public administration reform, it might be even easier than if we reform it altogether. Then we have to do the judicial reform this is much more difficult. It will not take, you know, one year, and we are understandable of that. We have started it, but of course we understand that we need to, to do it, you know, faster, and uh, it will not be easy, but we will do that. Uh, but the hardest thing for me right now is to say that, um, you know, we cannot let this discussion on uh, judicial reform or any other things that you can, Ukraine has to do to be conditions of our acceptance to the European Union. I think that those are the homework that we are working on, we have been working on for a number of years, and we will do for sure, because this is something we need for us. If we don't get the investments, I mean, we will not rebuild the economy. But those are not the conditions for the accession, because the conditions for the accessions we have done for more than 70%. And I think that we have shown that we are, you know, this, this nation in Europe, the only nation in Europe right now who are dying for uh, European values of freedom, of democracy, of... Uh, possibilities to choose our own way of government and uh, governance and rule. And this is something which a lot of countries in Europe did over their history, but haven't done for, for the next 70 years, for the previous 70 years. And I think this is a political statement of a, a accession to the EU that we deserve as a nation. And I'm very hopeful that, you know, European Union understands this as well. The unity of the EU has been also unprecedented. I, and I was surprised by it. I can tell you for sure, because as you said, I'm the head of the friendship group with France. I was very much surprised how French population also united specifically because they have special relations with Russia. So a lot of countries surprised us. A lot of countries are showing this bravery in giving us, you know, help and aid and military support. Um, some of the countries have surprised us negatively, they're in minority and we are working on them and I hope that Romania helps us to work with Austria, for example, uh, with Germany, for example. Um, it was a shock to hear the Austrian um, Minister of Foreign Affairs says that Ukraine should find another way not joining the EU. I believe there is no other way. I believe that, you know, we know what we stand for. We know why we are dying. Uh, but what, what does uh, Austrian minister stand for when he's saying that Ukraine should find another way, Does he, if he stands for the trade with Putin, if he stands for their, you know, uh, financing of his party from the Putin side, and those are not just political words on my part, uh, then this is not something which his population deserves, because his population is super supportive of Ukraine, and I know that for a fact. 
So in this way, we take it step by step. There is a big chunk of work we need all of us to do, and I'm sure we will do it. And we are open for any, you know, any any help, any ideas, any cooperation. But our accession to the EU cannot depend on certain conditions because I think we have done, uh, you know, e everything we need to do to prove that we were always a part of European family. We've been a part of European family for more than for more than two thousand years. We had the Russian occupation and Soviet Union occupation for more than 70 years, and it did not change our values, it did not change our way of thinking, and this war, I think, proves that better than I could ever say. Alona, I don't know how to take the words, if they are coming from a politician or they are coming from a proud and brave citizen of Ukraine, and I can assure you that Vienna is full of yellow and blue colors because that. the citizens believe yes. that and i can assure you that all the cities are full of those colors not because politicians chose it because but because people chose it and i will return to people while concluding this but not before asking anna uh, about a particular issue which you also raised is there something in particular which states around Ukraine can do to ensure strategic resilience on the economic side, on the human side, on the institutional side? So maybe you'd like to, to comment on that. I know you're active in the international affairs sphere and, and pretty sure the view you take represents the view of a generation, not only of um, a political view. Uh, the view of a generation that was raised um, under capitalism, but brought up with the communist uh, culture by our parents who lived during communism and lived their youth during communism. I was I was listening. I was listening very careful to what Natalie and what Alona were saying. And as uh, as a country that has gone through this uh, process of accession to the European Union, but also after the accession, it wasn't the integration did not happen the second day. Uh, and some reforms are necessary. And as Natalie said earlier, confidence and trust is built in time. Uh, Alona was talking about the judicial system. Um, I'm, I'm coming from, from a country that even though has been a member of the European Union for 15 years, we still have the mechanism, the CVM. Uh, when, in practical terms, when it comes to the European Union and, and joining uh, uh, the European family, there are a number of, of rules and, and, and a set of values that we all have to share. Uh, it's frustrating. It's extremely frustrating for Romania to be a member of the European Union for 15 years and, and still be part of the CVM and, and still not be part of Schengen. But these things do happen. We have understood that there are things that we need to improve at, at the level of, of Romania, but we do understand that uh, some decisions uh, are more complicated. This does not mean that either Romania or the European Union will not stand with Ukraine. We do stand with Ukraine. We do understand that it's not only your fight against the Russian Federation. We do understand that it's our, our fight against the Russian Federation. But we have to be extremely, um, extremely conscious that there is a, a there is this need of, of understanding each other better and of understanding that indeed confidence and trust is going to be gained and is going to be built in time. When it comes to, to, to Moldova and, and Georgia, we all have, including, including Ukraine, we all have to support Moldova's cause because they are as innocent as you are. Uh, and if, if we cannot leave them behind because they are a smaller economy and, and because things have happened. Um, I was listening to, to um, 
the conclusions uh, after after the Prime Minister of Romania and the President of the Chamber of Deputies uh, uh, went to to Kiev and and in other parts of Ukraine. And one of the conclusion was that in terms of bilateral relationship, we have entered a different phase, a phase where we we focus on the future and we focus less on on things that have happened or did not happen in the past. And this is very important. This is very important because we also have to be extremely careful about the disinformation and about the fake news. Uh, also Romania and other European countries are going through very difficult economic times. And we also have to be extremely careful to the vulnerabilities and sensitivities of, of the Romanian people and of, of, of people from the EU because um, I'm convinced and I can see from, from what's going on in the social media that the Russians will try to create this, this tension between helping Ukraine and helping the people that are in vulnerable uh, categories in Romania and in other countries. And we have to be very careful not to allow them to build on that uh, because we don't, our goal is 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 that you and us together can go through this and, and be stronger after this but we have to be very careful including with our pu public statements about the this sensitivities uh it's it's the war unfortunately has different different faces and disinformation and fake news is is one is one of them Yes, Romania has has said that we are willing to help with the reconstruction process as much as we can, uh, and we have to be honest and 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 look at things and and say that it does matter when the world the world will end and how, because for Ukraine, if if this war continues and if at the end of it the southern part the ports the main ports to the black sea will be uh, will not be under uh, under the ukrainian uh, jurisdiction it will be very complicated and we will have to adapt to to that situation and maybe romania maybe poland maybe other countries have to do more in helping you with your exports what i'm trying to say is that we are here we are very honest in what in the support we are offering and that we and i think that being being very honest to each other and communicating we can we can defeat this this awful <laughs> awful uh thing that russia russia has done um i hope that um i hope that my answer was uh was you not uh, focused enough to your question I think it's an answer of a very mature politician already, and uh, I, and I think it's a very honest answer. Um, and now, all the politicians will will um, cease to speak because I have a I have a question for all the humans in the in the invited in the panel, all the human speakers. Um, Alona actually said that none of the refugees, which are which are leaving Ukraine are begging for anything. And I can assure you, they are not. All the social media which I read is people asking, how can I help? Or I have the skills and I want to work, or I want to do this or provide this kind of support or uh, help me help others in Ukraine. And it's obviously that this is the war which is being fought by each and every individual, which stands for something, for freedom, for the ability to speak and decide on their life, for their families, for honesty, and ultimately, of course, for peace. And I would ask all the humans in the panels which have spoken until now, the human beings to maybe shortly touch on how can we ensure that all the people who try to live their life in peace 
can go through this? What can we do? What can we do as an individuals, as individuals? And um, I would ask uh, Natalie, Alona, and Anna to speak in that order shortly, and then Yulia to draw the conclusions of, um, of that or of the entire discussion. If in the meantime, there are questions, please ask them in the chat or otherwise, uh, the last word of the panel will belong to Yulia. Uh, and um, let me again, thank you very much for the inspiring words which you said, the bravery which you showed and the wisdom which you employ for your people and for the world. So Natalie, Alona, Anna, and then uh, Yulia will take over. Thank you very much. It's been really an honor. Thank you very much. I'll start by saying we're, of course, extraordinarily grateful for the compassion and the incredible support that's been shown by all European countries, Romania in particular, to Ukrainian refugees. But I <clears throat> would like there to be fewer refugees. So my number one goal would be for Ukraine to prevail and end the war so that fewer people leave, one, incremental people leave, and two, uh, that we start the rebuilding process for critical infrastructure and housing as quickly as possible, even if other economic sectors of the economy lag, so that people can come home. I have to be very clear that I believe that the demographic challenge facing Ukraine, <clears throat> if the migrants, if the refugees stay long out of the country, is a disaster, and I don't want that to be a new challenge for Ukraine going forward. So my goal would be with all due respect and gratitude for the incredible outpouring of compassion that we prevail in the war as quickly as possible. That means again, military support and financial support for Ukraine today to win. But then we look at housing and critical infrastructure first as a priority so that people can come home. Um, I think that it's, uh, excellent if the school systems in Europe can incorporate the uh, Ukrainian education that is online as part of the school system so that Ukrainian children don't lose a year or two. Rem remember, we've all been through COVID. We've all lost some time of, of the quality of education in the last couple of years so that they don't lose even more than that. <clears throat> I look forward to Ukrainian communities being built up in these different countries. When my parents left during World War II and they were displaced people and living in displaced person camps in Germany um, post-World War II, or towards the end of World War II, they had Ukrainian communities. They had Ukrainian churches. That means that the Ukrainian church has to be allowed to form in, in Europe. They had Ukrainian schools. They were allowed to keep that cultural tie. And I think that's very important. I think it's important because again, with all due respect, I want them all to come home or the, as many as possible. And so I would look uh, as next steps to those, those couple things being critical. Um, and again, not at all in any way denigrating the amazing compassion and support that's been received for the people without which we, 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 for which we're extraordinarily grateful. But there is a balance here and we want everyone to come home. <clears throat> Alona, you're, you're up. Yes. Um, well, I will, you know, I will finish with the same things I started. I, I am, I'm, I was incredibly impressed that actually the Romanian members of parliament and members of European parliament were among the first people to visit Bucha and Borodanka with us when it was still mined, when it was still dangerous, when, uh, you know, during the times we, we were there, we, we have just seen the exhumation started of the common graves of women and children in Bucha, which amounted to 260 people then. And, and, and a little, none of them actually killed by accident. So all of them were killed by a shot to the head. So executed. And this is something we've seen with your colleagues from Romania. And I think, you know, uh, I, I, I can tell you honestly, I don't know, uh, would I be brave enough to go to another country to do that if that happened, not in Ukraine. So that, that's super impressive. And I, I do thank all of you. And I thank, you know, a, a lot that you have done for us. I think we've had, a history for a long time of this um, mutual European integration and mutual support, but this times, you know, they 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 are very black and white. We understand clearly what you are doing for us, guys. Um, yesterday there was another victory for all of us. I think um, 
we have elected in the Council of Europe the um, new judge from Ukraine uh, to their um, European Court of Human Rights. And I'm telling the story because it's personal to me. It's Mr. Gnatowski. Romanians uh, have also supported him. Thank you very much for that. He is actually my professor um, in Kiev. Uh, you know, a long time ago was a, when I was studying international law, and he was leading a course on international hum humanitarian law. This is the course where we've met with my husband, who was fighting to get him elected yesterday in the Council of Europe, and we had these discussions after his class of international humanitarian laws this is how we you know got got together with my husband and dated for a while after that because i was very much idealistic and i believed in international law and my dream was to work in some kind of international organizations like unhcr and my husband dima was very cynical even back then i think and he's told me that nothing like this works why do we learn those geneva conventions and protocols to geneva conventions and all of those things when the war starts, no rules work. It is, you know, just the force of the most powerful one. Uh, this is all bullshit and it all doesn't work. Um, and in some, some way, I have to say that he was probably right because Putin destroyed all European and world security in just, you know, a number of days. Uh, he's right now, I was just sending a link is that he's right now talking through his propag propagandist on how great the nuclear war could be for Russians because they will all go to heaven. And this is something which I quote, I just posted it on Twitter because this is something they are talking about on the National Russian TV channel right now. Um, and in some way, you know, Dima was right that, yeah, international humanitarian law does not work. But in the same time, I think that he was very wrong. And I'm much more optimistic right now on the future of our world because, yes, we could not, with our institutions, we couldn't prevent a war from from going forward but the unity we received the support we received uh, the opening all the borders for ukrainians from your side from the european union from other countries the financial agreements you know the unity to stand against this war against the aggressor against the breakage of everything it is super you know phenomenal for me i think that after covid after how separated we got after those difficult years after uh, you know, how many national movements there were in every country in Europe and how difficult it was to keep this unity from going, uh, how difficult it was to even talk about the united uh, defense of Europe. I think that something changed in us with this war and the unity we see is quite overwhelming and quite optimistic for me. So I still do believe in this power of international humanitarian law. I believe that we will draw the right confusion, conclusions to make sure that this never happens again. I don't know if it is possible, but I really hope that, you know, it will be. Um, and I'm, I'm very optimistic on what, where we are going. I do believe that Ukraine will win, that our values will win. Um, and I, I think that altogether we have, you know, we have become much more stronger after this war will end and hopefully end with victory. And with this message of hope, I, I, you know, I want to thank you for this organization because I've started on quoting Dickens a little bit from the tale of two cities. And I think this is a perfect message for me, at least right now. Um, he said that, uh, you know, it was the worst of times and it was the best of times. And we've seen so much bravery and we've seen so much misery. And we've seen the spring, uh, and I quote, of course, not, uh, not, not really the quotes, but something that I feel, we've seen the spring of despair really um, and we now see the spring of hope for the whole world and for the whole Ukraine. And I'm sure that, you know, the good in us, the, the values we all share will for sure win. And uh, we will be more united than we've ever been before. And I think it's pretty great, actually. <laughs> Absolutely. And I will finish just uh, follow up in that I wish to all of us, to Ukraine, to you, to the whole world, to be strong uh, on the field of protecting European values, like human values, uh, justice, freedom, dignity. And I wish all of us to transport this experience into resilience and became uh, more stronger leaders of the world and really build this good society, which is the core of the dream of all Aspen Institutes around the globe. I'm so grateful to our partners, Aspen Romania, for having this event today. I'm grateful to, to, to all speakers, like such a high level speakers. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm so touched with each personal stories. I'm so touched with like Anna's, I know Anna for, for many years. 
for your contribution. I, with my family of three small kids under six, I spent a, more than a week in Romania. I was so warmly greeted. I'm so grateful for that. So we feel your support. We highly appreciate it. And we, the truth will definitely prevail. Ukraine will prevail. And we will organize a big Aspen gathering in Kyiv or maybe Crimea. Also a good idea very, very soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.